Hello, and welcome to the Hour of History podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Bauman. It's been a few weeks since our last episode. I said before I'm scaling back and doing about one a month now, but wow, have the episodes been great this year. It's been great to have you along listening to the podcast the faithful listeners coming back for more. I like to highlight these episodes a little longer because each of our guests puts in so much time to becoming an expert in their field, and this week's guest is no different. It's kind of relevant, the topic as well, as much of the world goes through this current battle with COVID-19, fighting against sort of an invisible enemy. Dr. Tom de Blasi is a assistant professor at St. Joseph's College, a PhD and an expert in psychology. We chat about the history of psychology, specifically behaviorism, interspersed with some discussion about things like what's happening in the world today, COVID, isolation, depression, anger, things like this, as well as lighter topics like video games and mice and rabbits and science, stuff that's not always on Hour of History, but is things that historians think about quite often. Tom is an interesting guest, not only because he's well-researched and absolutely an expert on psychology, but because he combines both practice and teaching. So he's got a foot in the academy, and he's got a foot out in the so-called real world as well. Uh, He brings both of those things to this passion he has for finding answers about the human condition, and I think you'll find this a fascinating podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Hour of History podcast. Please subscribe and drop us a line. We love to have guests by suggestion, and often they turn out to be some of the best guests on the show. So let us know who you want to hear, hourofhistory.com forward slash contact. Thanks again for listening on Hour of History. It's our world, anytime, any place. Enjoy. You're listening to the Hour of History podcast. Our Our world, anytime, any place. For show notes, the Hour of History blog, and more, head over to hourofhistory.com. For book recommendations about topics mentioned during the podcast, head over to hourofhistory.com forward slash rex. That's hourofhistory.com forward slash r-e-c-s. Without further delay, the Hour of History starts right now. So, Tom de Blasi, Dr. Tom de Blasi, welcome to the Hour of History podcast. So good to have you. Thank you, Stephen. It's nice to be here. So, uh, we're really branching out on the Hour of History podcast because history isn't just historians working in the history department. While I love those people too, there's there's historians all over the place. Uh, maybe you could tell us what you do, Tom. Sure. So, uh, my degree is in clinical psychology, um, and so I work with clients who want to improve their lives, right? And I think I'm very cautious of saying uh, people with mental illness, right? Because I think that it's not a whole, whole, it's not a very holistic approach. Um, And so there are people who come to therapy who don't meet criteria for mental illness and they still benefit from it. Um, And so I work in a very clinical setting, but I also teach full time um, over at St. Joseph's College over on Long Island. Hmm. And yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, go on. Sorry. <laughs> so I teach um, um, mostly undergraduate students or all undergraduate students rather, but from between intro to psych to senior thesis to counseling psych, forensic psych. Um, so yeah, I, I've taught history of psychology in the past in particular uh, at a different college. And I have to say, I think that that class is a lot of fun to teach because then you start to hear the whole story about how psychology was created. And I think you can better understand where psychology is today by knowing that story. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And and we'll have some time to get into the history of psychology. Um, but part of this show is being biographical as well, because I love to hear people's stories. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a very interesting choice you've made to do this dual clinical and uh, educational mm-hmm. academic path. Maybe you could tell us how you got into that. Yeah, so uh, I was doing counseling work as young as 19 years old. Um, I started doing substance abuse counseling when I was 19. Um, and truthfully, I was too young. I mean, I, I should not have been doing substance abuse counseling when I was 19. Um, but I think that was when I really started to love it. And I loved working with that population in particular because oftentimes substance users are ridiculed and ostracized and kind of shamed by society. 
um, and they become outcast. And if you want someone to change, you have to treat them like a human being. All the research shows that. And just kind of human decency, right? Just kind of common sense would make us think that to begin with. Um, and I think I really got a chance to see that a lot of people weren't changing because there's a lack of support and validation and a system in place to help them. Um, and so <clears throat> I went on to do some other work I was a crisis counselor. I worked as a crisis counselor for about five years in total. Um, and then eventually went to grad school for uh, clinical psychology, uh, where I particularly worked with Dr. Howard Kasanov, who wrote the book on anger management. And similar to s people who are using substances, they're often other referred. They often come to treatment not because they want to be there, right? It's often ego dystonic. I mean, they want to, they're forced there from probation or parole for the court system. Um, and again, I think that I have a special uh, interest or passion for working with those people, those clients, because they really, most of them don't want to keep abusing substances or wanting to hit uh, their significant other, right? They actually feel a credible amount of remorse for it afterwards. Most people, I don't want to say everybody, most people. <laughs> and I think that my goal in continuing to work clinically and, and teaching and doing research in this area, anger, domestic violence, and revenge, is to try and better help those people because if we can prevent people from abusing to begin with whether it be substances or other people then there's no need for interventions for the victims but also they can start to, we can start to see that change to begin with right and, and i think that is where my passion lies so i like to try and work with clients in that capacity as well as teaching uh so i could, so I could teach the undergrads as well right the people kind of entering our field the new people to kind of have that passion and compassion for other people is back in the 70s when this was when substance abuse was really become quite popular um you know in terms of treatment for it you know there's a lot of ridicule you know there's a lot of ostracizing even by a therapist and so if what we're seeing and we've seen for several decades now according to the research is if you treat someone with compassion that changes and so i want to try and pass that on to my students as well wow that's fantastic and i'm sure you've had a ton of influential advisors you you mentioned the Dr. Howard Kasanoff, who, who is the author of this work on anger management. Uh, w was it the research under him that brought you to the anger management? I think it's a compelling topic that, that everyone has, has some sort of connection to. Is that why it's, you're, you're attracted to anger management and substance abuse? Yeah, I think that they're, those two fields are related, but anger management and substance abuse, right? Anger is directly related to substance use. Um, there's lack of inhibition when you're using substances. Um, and I think I started to learn a lot more about anger from my work with him. Um, and I just kind of fell in love with working with that population and the research related to it because it's really under research, right? I mean, for every one article that's published on anger is about seven on anxiety and 10 on depression, hmm. right? And so how can we really go ahead and help someone if we don't really even know what we're talking about? And so we have made advancements over the past two decades um, on anger management, but it's really, again, under research compared to anxiety and depression. With, in that research, you can go ahead and start narrowing down what genes are related to some extent, right? Here in anger, you know, we're still trying to figure out, uh, well, amygdala is related to anger, but we don't really know too much about the, the neurotransmitters and how that relates. So we're still trying to backtrack a little bit. Um, we're still several de decades behind depression and anxiety. But, Hmm. And maybe we can start right there getting into it. And, and you have written on this before about the challenge of objectivity and, and psychology and whether it's a science or, or what we do know scientifically and what we don't know and how people work through that. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how, how would you label it? Science or what? Yeah, so it's funny. I, science or pseudoscience. It's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it, there's the book that was published a few years ago by uh I think it was Scott Leinfeld um that goes ahead and tries to parse apart what is what are some scientific interventions and some what are some pseudoscience interventions and I think the study of psychology in general is a scientific a science but I think there are a lot of um miscellaneous and extraneous things that get lumped underneath psychology um, so, for example, crystals, right, the use of crystals, uh, I mean, that's been shown to not be effective. And I mean, there's some people that argue a placebo effect, but the use of crystals in terms of improving one's mood, right, that is not a scientific intervention, and yet it gets lumped as one. 
Hmm. Um, and so I, I think psychology itself, when you take apart these pseudoscience um, interventions, which most psychologists, I will say, don't use, but when you take them apart, you do find that it is a science, but it can't be held to the same standard as biology or physics or chemistry, right? If you look at the kappa ratings, which is just a measure of interrated reliability um, for psychology, it's considered lower, right? It's about a third lower than what it is for biology, right? It's between 0.4 to 0.6 compared to 0.6 to point um, for psychology and biology, respectively. And in, in all honesty, that's actually quite great, in my, my opinion, for it to be 0.6. It doesn't mean it's not room for improvement, right? If it's, mm-hmm. it's 0.4 to 0.6, the other way, room for imp- improvement for psychology. But what it does go to show that there's so many variables to consider with psychology, right? Everyone's a learning history. What you've Everything you've encountered for your entire period of life has to be factored in for psychology. When it comes to biology, you're just looking at the same bacteria over and over and over again, right? It doesn't change very much. Hmm. But humans are so different, so diverse, and that's what makes us unique and beautiful. But it also makes it very hard to study psychologically. Um, and so I think psychology is doing the best it can, and it can still be doing better. Hmm. And now you've taught courses on the origins of psychology and, and you've told us the substance abuse is relatively new, but maybe we can go back a bit further. Uh, when, when did this become a field? Yes, yeah, so psychology really came about, well, so the study of psychology formally came about with Wilhelm Bunt in 1879. He established the first psych lab in Germany, in Leipzig, Germany. Um, so we're really kind of going back, you know, 150 years. Um, but the idea of studying human behavior has been around for centuries, hmm. right? I mean, you go back to Aristotle, right? Buddha. Um, you, you can go back centuries and you can go ahead, a Confucius, right? You can go ahead and find that people have been looking for, looking at the study of human behavior for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, but so I think that's important because that really has influenced psychology up until this day. Um, because our groundwork comes from them, right? The philosophers. Um, but it formally was created by Willem Wundt in 1879. And when Wundt really created psychology, it was very uh, introspective, right? So it was very much about the mental states. His work, would, we would call today a sensation and perception, right? And so he looked at some behavioral observations, but his work and his student Titchener, right? really was much more uh, cognitive. And although they didn't want it to be that way, they wanted to be more objective, they did the best they could at that time. Um, it, psychology started to become more of a pseudoscience. Um, and this became especially true when you're talking, when Freud uh, kind of popularized psychology. So Freud did most of his writing between 1895 and 1905. He wrote afterwards and before that, but most of his writing came during that 10 year period. And that really, kind of set the groundwork for psychology and psychotherapy. And so it was really, there's a lack of objectivity, a lack of behavior, a uh, lack of focus on behavior at that point. And so it wasn't until uh, John Watson actually gave a co- the Behaviorist Manifesto in 1913 over at Columbia University, and la- later became a publication in 1914, um, so psychology started to try and re- revert back to this objectivity. And, and Watson was kind of fighting an uphill battle because back in, um, for, for it had given what was known as the Clark Lectures over here in, in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, actually. Uh, the Clark Lectures was a series of lectures to celebrate Clark College. At the time, it was called Clark College, hmm. now Clark University. Um, yeah, I know. It's funny to think about different time periods now. <laughs> if you remember what year I'm in. Uh, um, but it, at the time, it was called Clark College. It was, 20, it was celebrating their 20-year anniversary. Anniversary. And so they invited Carl Jung, a student of Freud, and Freud to go ahead and come give some speeches um, about psychology and their work. And so as a result, Freud's work became very popular, and the audience was the director of Harvard's med school at the time, if I remember correctly. Um, And so Harvard went ahead and and really kind of used Freud's work um, as the basis for psychiatry. And so today, most psychiatrists are still very psychoanalytically trained, that's starting to shift more so. Uh, they're becoming more and more CBT oriented, or, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means later on. Um, but it, we're starting to see that shift now. It's taken few if, over the past few decades, and about 100 years later, to be able to see that shift. Um, but Watson and behaviorism really came in revolt too uh, 
Freud's approach. And so he said that psychology should be the scientific study of human behavior, right? Um, and he really questioned whether or not psychology was a field at this point, right? Hmm. Um, yeah, it, it was very, he's very uh, uh, crass and blunt and kind of to the point in a lot of ways. Um, but he, uh, he said the primary goal of behaviorism, right? And he's known as the father of behavior, behaviorism, John Watson, uh, should be to predict and control behavior. Right. He said, nothing else matters as much as those two things. The point of behaviors and the point of psychology in his mind should be to predict and control behavior. And this should all be done using a scientific and objective approach, right? We want to describe and explain behavior, right? The four primary goals of science in general is to predict, control, describe, and explain, hmm. right? And he's saying that those four things should be essential to psychology. If this is going to be a science, why wouldn't we have the same four goals? And it makes a lot of sense, right, to all of us now, 100 years later, uh, but it, it wasn't the case 100 years ago. Um, and so he really started this revolt um, back in 1913. Yeah, and so maybe we can take a second there uh, and also to contextualize what's happening. Not only is this like an ex extraordinary event getting these minds together and it, it really gives you an appreciation for academic conferences. And, and like I tell people, you never really know who's in the audience and who might take this back somewhere and, and, and create their own thing. But 1913 is on the eve of World War I, still very much in this imperial mm -hmm. science period. So it's interesting, this, this search for truth. You mentioned mm -hmm. a couple times objectivity. Now, historians have argued over what objectivity actually means since mm -hmm. history existed, also you know, tracing its roots to 19th century Germany and, and mm -hmm. also the sort of ancient roots as well. But uh, what, what in this sense is Watson saying with objectivity? Is it this predict, control, describe, explain thing? Does he want results? Yeah, so he wants to be able to be objective. So when we're talking about Freud, Vaughn, and Titchener, right, they, there are a lot of subjectivity. Right, so a lot of it would be, I think you're experiencing these emotions, or I think that you're thinking, and I think that you're having uh, this reaction. Uh, and you can use self-report data, but that's not very objective, right? And so Watson said, uh, I don't care, I believe you think, but I don't care that you think, mm. right? I wanna look at just what's objective. I wanna know, you know, I believe that, for example, just relate back to anger management for, for a moment. I believe that you no longer wanna hit your wife. Fine. I believe you might think that, but I want to see the behavior, right? I want to see that you no longer hit your wife, right? That behavior is so important, right? And so that's, that's when results would come in. And so that's the root foundations of this behaviorism. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's just looking at the behavior. And again, he said, I don't care that you think. You probably think I can't test that, right? I know I think, but you can't test that I think. All we can say is what you do. And so let's focus on what you, you're doing. Let's focus on your behavior. Hmm. And did this turn humans into kind of lab projects? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a good point. That's definitely one of the criticisms of behaviorism that it looks, it seems very reductionistic and mechanic, me mechanistic rather. Um, however, um, I think actually, and I'm going to get into this I think a little bit later on, but a good behaviorist approach is actually incredibly compassionate. Um, and so actually, I'll, I'll just get into it now, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was talking to a colleague earlier about uh, clients, actually, and um, he comes from a more psychodynamic perspective, uh, but I come from a much more behavioral perspective. And I was talking about a behavior chain. Right? And so a behavior chain is going ahead and looking at all the sequence of events that led up to person engaging in a behavior. And so when I work with clients who are suicidal, um, I, I certainly use this quite a bit. And so we kind of use the past 24 hours as a marker. So the past 24 hours, what are any vulnerability factors, right? How has your sleep? How has your eating been? What has your mood been like? Any stress? And so everyone's a little bit more vulnerable right now, at least in the New York area, given COVID. Right? I'd imagine to uh, pretty much anybody listening to this is probably affected by COVID in some capacity, even if it's not spreading quite a bit uh, by them. Uh, but a lot of people are locked down up here. So everyone right now is really kind of more vulnerable right off the bat. Um, we know, too, not getting good night's sleep, not eating well, uh, not exercising, being more stressed. All these things impact our ability to regulate our emotions and regulate our behaviors. 
So right off the bat, we know that someone might be a little bit more vulnerable to engage in suicidal uh, injurious behaviors, right? Cutting oneself, whatever it might be. And so we go through a chain of events that led to what they identify as the main trigger, right? So a common example might be rejection from a friend, right? Or a significant other. So we go through step by step by step, any thoughts, feelings, behaviors, uh, physiological responses that led to the person engaging the behavior. And we really break this down over a 24 hour time period. And what we find is that anybody who would have, anybody who had that sequence of events would have engaged in that exact same sequence of behaviors. Right. If you factor mm. someone's genes and learning history into it, and this is very a very behavioral approach, um, it's very Skinnerian, um, and we'll talk about Skinner at some point, I'm sure. Um, mm. But when you think about uh, one's genes and learning history, you know, anybody with those genes, anybody with those learning histories, that makes up our personality, if you want to call it that. But anyone with those genes and learning history would do the exact same thing. And so a behaviorist viewpoint on that is actually incredibly compassionate because what they're saying is, look, I understand you didn't want to do it, but given everything, right? Given the fact that you didn't sleep well, you didn't eat well, uh, you have, you've learned that you get your way by doing this, engaging this behavior, right? You've learned that's how, that's how you've coped over this time. And it's helped you to some capacity. It doesn't mean it's always the most functional, but it's helped you to some extent. Of course you cut yourself. It doesn't mean we want, we want you to keep doing it. Right? We can talk about ways to change that, but I think we have to understand and validate that first before we can go ahead and begin to change. And behaviorism really helps with that understanding component. So in a way, you're doing like microbiographies of every person that you interact with, <laughs> just looking at the past 24 hours. But you talk about things that are incredibly hard to understand, certainly if you're not a scientist uh, or mm. if you're not a historian, the genes and the learning history. How, yeah. how does one possibly get at that? Yeah, so it's certainly... Um, so it's certainly hard to get at genes, right? I would say, I think one way we get at it is by looking to see their family history of anxiety or depression in one's family. Um, but it, what we know is that genes influence our behavior, right? They set the, the map, right, for us to walk down. Doesn't mean we always go left or right, right? Sometimes we can carve out our own path, right? But it's pretty, it lays down the path that we think we're going to go ahead and, and go down, right? So this is an example of that. Um, Schizophrenia, there was a big study that was done um, the past 10, 20 years, or 20 years ago, um, that looked at the genetic rates for schizophrenia. If your identical twin has schizophrenia, there's about a 45% chance that you're going to develop schizophrenia, right? And so what we know about genes, right, or identical twins, is that they have the same genes, right? They're born with the same genes, at least, right? They're monozygotic twins. Hmm. And so given that, we would expect, if, if schizophrenia is purely genetic, we would expect that it'd be 100%, right? But the fact that it's not 100%, and in fact it's 45%, means that genes play a major role, but it's not the only role. And the other role would be the learning history. So learning history is trying to really understand what behaviors have you learned throughout your life, and then reinforce what behaviors have been punished. And so looking at that capacity more than anything else, that helps us understand the learning history and the genes we can get through, um, you know, what the family history has been. Mm -hmm. And I imagine as time goes forward and scientific methods become more advanced, genes will become a greater part of the equation. But scientists yeah. going back to 1913 have had quite a bit to look at as far as learning. Um, is, is that where they started? Yeah, so um, if, so they started the, the idea of associationism, right, which is the beginning. So behaviorism really comes in three ways, okay? Um, and there are even larger ways we could talk about, but I'm just going to talk about the three waves of behaviorism itself. Um, so just to name them, it's associationism. And that time period is about the early, just a few years before 1900 to about 1930. There's neo-behaviorism, which is 1930 to about 1960, and socio-behaviorism, which is 1960 to the present. Um, and they've all kind of evolved a little bit over time, and, and I'll explain this all. Um, but associationism really started with um, the British philosophers more than anything. Okay, so John Locke, David Hume, 
the idea of a reflex response. And yes, it's the same John Locke who <laughs> our constitution is based off, right? Um, but he came up with this idea to bula rasa. And to bula rasa means blank slate. And so it's, his idea was that we come into this world as a blank slate, right? learning, knowing nothing, and that we learn everything from our environment. And we learn everything in particular based off associations. We learn that if I do X, then Y happens. Okay. Um, I learned that if there is a green light, I should go if I'm driving a car, right? And so we learn by this association, if X, then Y. Now, we no longer believe, right, again, that in this idea of tabula rasa, we do believe in this idea of uh, genes and the environment having an interplay and interaction effect and reciprocal, reciprocal interaction. But that idea of associations and reflect, reflexive response was huge because it led to the beginning of Pavlov and Watson's work. Hmm. And so um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Ivan Pavlov, right, with this study of the dogs and trying to get them to salivate. Um, and so just Pavlov's work is the beginning of classical conditioning, right? So to kind of go over that briefly, um, it's the idea of an unconditioned stimulus being paired with a neutral stimulus to then evoke a conditioned response, right? So when Pavlov's work if you present an unconditioned stimulus like food to a dog, the dog will start to salivate, right? Uh, and what his graduate students actually noticed first, which, and they brought it to Pavlov's attention, um, which is when Pavlov started doing the studies, the studies um, was when they turned the light on to feed the dogs on the weekend, the dogs immediately started salivating. And so they wanted to know how was that the case, right? How do they start to salivate right off the bat? It's almost like they knew that they were going to get fed. Um, by just turning on the light. And what they found was that light was acting as neutral stimulus. Turning on a light in the, by itself is not going to lead to a dog thinking, hey, I'm gonna get fed right now. But pairing that with then the food shortly thereafter lets the dog start to salivate to just the light, right? Or in Pavlov's studies later on, it was a metronome or this, uh, the sound of a bell, right? In all these studies, it was exactly that. Hmm. Having that neutral stimulus to the unconditioned stimulus led to the dogs salivating. Um, and so Watson became aware of this and thinking about the time period, right? They didn't have email at the time. They couldn't go ahead and just communicate with one another so easily. So Watson became aware of this a little bit later on, um, really took it and ran with it, right? And so Watson was very famous for his study uh, with little Albert, which is about 1919, 1920. And so little Albert, who we don't fully know who, who we later became, right? Little Albert was a, a code name for him. Um, hmm. We believe it was the son of one of the wet nurses that he worked with. Wow. Um, yeah, so we don't fully know. Uh, this study would probably not be uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I think so that's safe happen. to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but he wanted to know, look, we want to talk about prediction and control, right? We want to talk about description and explanation. The most experimental way and scientific way I can go ahead and look at this, right, and say hey, that we take in information through associations is by trying to create an association for a child and then take away that association, right? So essentially, he was pretty looking at emotions. Can I go ahead and make a child afraid of something and then alleviate that fear, okay? And so what he did uh, was they presented a white rat to little Albert. Right. And little Albert did not have any sort of aversive reaction to the white rat. In fact, you know, he wasn't afraid of it, but wasn't, you know, jumping for joy and playing with it either. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, which is interesting, right? Because, you know, humans usually have this disgust reaction to a rat, right? mm -hmm. you know, but that might be a learned response then. Um, but so we went ahead and paired the rat, just uh, got a few baseline measures, wanted to see how little Albert responded to the rat. And what he found was when he paired the rat, with a loud noise, the bang of a hammer against a metal pipe, right? Little Albert became scared, right? as you normally would, right. especially as a baby. Right? And so little Albert started to cry when this was done repeatedly. And pretty soon little Albert associated the, the rat with a loud noise. And Watson, right, uses as evidence to say, look, I conditioned this response, this fear response in little Albert. And he didn't just stop there. What he also wanted to see was how far does this condition response go? Hmm. And so he also had some baseline measures previously of how this would, how the, the little Albert responded to a dog, a seal fur coat, a monkey, 
a rabbit, uh, fire, and Santa Claus mask, right? And so some animals and some non-animals. The idea was to see, you know, there's a gradient of how similar is this or, or each of these novel, uh, yeah, novel stimuli to the rat. And so what he found was this, the stimuli that are closest, closely resemble the rat provoked the most fear response in little Albert, even though there was no loud noise present, even though they were not present when the loud noise was, um, was done, that was only done with the rat, little Albert is still afraid of the rabbit. Okay? He was afraid of the dog, less so when the dog was near his face, he was, he was afraid of it, but less so than the rabbit. The idea was that they weren't quite the same, right? They, was, they mm. were, he was able to discriminate between the two. It's called stimulus discrimination. Um, and he wasn't afraid at all of the fire, was afraid a little bit of the seal fur coat, um, and was a little bit afraid of the Santa Claus mask. Uh, although uh, there's a video of, little, of John Watson doing this experiment with little Albert online on YouTube. Um, and if you look, <laughs> the mask itself just kind of looks scary. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I don't really know how, how much, uh, how unreasonable it would be for little Albert to have a fearful response to that mask, especially given how close uh, John Watson gets to him with that mask. Um, if you can look it up, I think it's kind of funny. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a link to that for sure. But I'm, I'm wondering, yeah. as you're saying this, how come, uh, how has our brain changed where now, you know, we get terrible content on Twitter, yet we still want to log on. Um, you'd think there would be a yeah. fear reaction created there or the news. People seem to hate the news, but you continue <laughs> to re watch it. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I'd say it's two things that are at play, right? One of them is that it, when things are intermittent, it's, we are very, um, that's the strongest type of response to, to extinguish. So this is a little bit more scenarian and, and operant conditioning, right? But when we are intermittently reinforced, it's very hard to break that pattern. So once in a while we find things that we like and once in a while we find things that are quite scary. Mm. Right? But when things are uh, intermittently reinforced and we have that po intermittent positive reinforcement, which is what casinos actually use, um, which is why they're so addicting. Um, and you can't walk away from the machine, but first-hand experience. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you have that, it, that's the hardest type of reinforcement to break. So that certainly plays a role. Mm. And the other part too is this perceived fear response. Um, and so there's a lot of research that kind of looks at this out of the health prevention model and the health prevention belief model. Um, because right now we can't seem to look away. It's similar to you can't look away at it when you see a bad car accident. Right? Mm. It, it does capture this intrigue in us and human nature, right? And I think a lot of it has to do from an evolutionary perspective, trying to be aware of what the harm is and what the, the potential dangers might be to us. Um, well, there's not a great, there's not a ton of research looking at some of this stuff, uh, looking at that exact reason, um, but there is some looking at that. And I think a lot of it has to do from an evolutionary perspective. Interesting. And so maybe if we just step away for one second as we're going through the history of behaviorism here, we're still, you know, in the first half of the 20th century. But uh, right. since we're talking about it, you know, and there's this COVID thing is happening and it seems like it's very hard to do any other thinking because it's you're surrounded by news and, and fear. It is like watching a car accident. What, what is your perspective of, of what's happening uh, right now from us? psychological perspective yeah i think a lot, a lot of people this is an astute observation but a lot of people are afraid um and of course kind of like of course that's the case right but i think a lot of people are concerned for themselves and for their family and i think what's happening is this mass pandemic right which the media fuels a little bit um and at the end of the day we really don't know a lot right i think that the information is changing constantly. It's so dynamic, right? But I think what what's not great for our own mental health is being locked uh, kind of inside our own homes hmm. for a lot of people, although I think that is necessary to some capacity right now. But I think what we don't realize is there's a lot that we can still do in our own homes, right? Humans want the ability of choice, right? particularly Americans. We want to be able to choose to stay home. Some of what people are doing right now is just staying home and maybe binging Netflix. Maybe something that they would do on a normal summer vacation anyway when they just got a week off of work, right? Mm. But they chose to do it versus going ahead and being forced to do it. And that choice really makes a big difference. But I think what 
we need to do is remind ourselves that we do have some choice in the matter too. We can choose to do a few things. Right? I, I just was interviewed for a piece about how uh, anger is more prevalent a little bit more, right, at least right now, given everything with COVID. And a lot of this has to do is that we've t a lot of our coping skills have been taken away from us, right? But when we're angry and annoyed, we don't, we, we're very narrowly focused and we don't, we're not very good at thinking outside the box. And so what we have to realize is that we can be creative and do all these, find new coping skills to do at home, right? Maybe you're used, in, used to playing basketball or football, right? And you can't do that anymore, right? Or just getting out of the house for a little bit. Now what you can do is have a puzzle, right? Speak to other people in your home, right? Who might be getting your nerves now because we've been with them for too long <laughs> about need, <laughs> needing a little bit of space. Right? And I think they need that too, but maybe you don't know how to approach that conversation. I think that's so important to have that conversation because my guess is that most people are feeling that. And it's very important that you have that conversation just for both of your own or all of your own mental health. So maybe that means you have a puzzle you play with once in a while. You play cards by yourself, right? So this, but just having individual alone time. Sorry. Yeah. So does this get a little bit into the reinforcement and, and Skinner and, and talking about getting something positive? It might be, and also throwing this out of whack because say before, you know, I'd, I'd play an hour of, of Xbox or whatever after mm -hmm. I'd done a day's worth of work, but now I can wake up and play. So it's, so it's not a positive anymore. It's just, there and so it kind of loses some of its restorative effect is is that can that get us back to the history a little <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and so um so to, to your point actually because when john, john watson was done with his work and he was kind of forced out of psychology um actually for having an affair with his uh graduate student rosley rayner um mm. so at that time period if you were in academia you would be, and you had an affair, you were caught having an affair anyway. Uh, you were kind of kicked out of the, the community. Um, and so he never got a chance to cure little Albert. Um, oh. But yeah, I know, I know. So, <laughs> and we're not sure what happened to him exactly, right? There's some thoughts, um, some people, of the people we think he might be, uh, there are some that say he died young, not from this, I think from other uh, physical defects anyway, physical health concerns. Um, I, and he died, I think, at like five and a half years old. There's one one person we think was uh, was him, but there's another one who lived a long, healthy life, but was always afraid of rats and rabbits. Mm -hmm. um, and so we learned that response it's, that stuck with us. Um, but kind of moving on from there, um, John John Watson's period of associationism kind of ended around 1930, and then neo behaviorism really kind of took hold in 1930. Neo behaviorism was kind of led by B. F. Skinner. And he really um, did a lot of his writing between 1930 and 1960. So he's the one who really spoke with this idea of reinforcement and punishment. And there are many different types of reinforcement, well, not many, four different types of reinforcement punishment schedules. Um, and of positive reinforcement, there are four more schedules um, you can look at. But Skinner's work was, again, was very similar to Watson in the sense that he cared about objectivity, but he wanted to look at just the observable behavior. Now, he focused a little bit more also on verbal behavior than Watson did, um, but didn't really give in to that idea of, I want to know everything you were thinking. If you admit the behavior, if you're telling me, speaking right you, as you are right now, that is a behavior, but it's not the same thing as a motor behavior. So he really made sure to draw that difference. Um, and so if they did neo-behaviorism or radical behaviorism, as Skinner goes on to call it, um, looks at positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment and negative punishment. And so don't think about positive and negative as good or bad. Think about it just as the presence or absence of. Positive mm -hmm. meaning presence, negative meaning absence. Okay? So positive reinforcement is the presence of reinforcement, the, the presence of an appetite or a stimulus, right? The presence of something you like, right? So playing Xbox, right? Uh, going ahead, I have a switch. I play Super Smash Brothers all the time. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, but I, that's the example of positive reinforcement. If I play that for an hour after uh, finish grading some of my students' papers, right, or finish writing a little bit of an article, right, I'm positively reinforcing my behavior. Now, positive reinforcement is the best type of reinforcement, but a lot of people, Skinner would argue, and, and later behaviorists argue too, is that a lot of people work from this negative reinforcement perspective, 
And negative re reinforcement is trying to remove, right, negative, absence of, trying to remove an aversive stimulus, something you don't like. So a good example of this is the annoying uh, alarm that goes off in your car when you don't wear your seatbelt, mm. right? A lot of people put their seatbelts on just to not have to hear that noise, right? Which is why they put that into effect, right? Um, and so negative reinforcement is actually quite prevalent. Um, and there are some people who argue that we do a lot more for negative reinforcement than positive reinforcement. We do a lot more and live our life more so to avoid negative outcomes than we do for positive outcomes, which is quite um, the thing about the existential dilemma, right? It really makes us question a little bit how do we live our lives right now, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's just an intricate topic I'm always interested in is existentialism. I think that, again, this, this relates, psychology was based on philosophy, um, and it's just very uh, interesting to think about how, how this all how this all does relate because nothing lives in a bubble, right? I mean, yeah. history, you know. Um, going from there is positive, re um, positive punishment and negative punishment as well. Positive punishment is what you stereotypically think of with punishment. It's the presence of an aversive stimulus. So uh, hitting a child, for example, is positive punishment. Berating somebody, yelling at somebody is positive punishment. Whereas negative punishment would be taking away something that somebody likes. Right. Oh, you didn't do your homework by seven o'clock when you were supposed to, and we agreed on. Fine, you're not having dessert tonight. Mm. Right. Dessert was something that they wanted to have, but you took that away as a result of um, not fulfilling their end of the bargain. I'm referring to a kid, at least. Right. Mm. Um, but uh, and so what we find is that all four approaches are pretty effective, actually, in changing behavior and looking at behavior. Um, and, and Skinner is well known for looking at the Skinner box and trying this first with animals and pigeons and rats. Um, so when thinking about the study of behaviorism in rats, that really comes actually from Skinner more than anybody else. Um, Skinner kind of popularized a lot of that hmm. uh, with his work. Um, and from there, we have different schedules of reinforcement. Um, do you want me to go into those or I don't know if I'm kind of going on? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get, well, let's keep going on at, because this is, seems to be an important part that continues and influences mm -hmm. the next the next stage of yeah. thought yeah so from this idea of positive reinforcement right so again positive reinforcement is going ahead and uh the presence of an appetitive stimulus right the presence of something you want right there are four different schedules that you can have right there's fixed or variable and interval ratio Right, so if something's fixed it's exactly what it sounds like right it's a kind of like a fixed um Fixed mortgage rate, right? Um, that's it's staying exactly that. Whatever rate you got it at is exactly what you're staying at. Whereas mm -hmm. variable means it could change, right? So fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval, and variable interval are four different types of positive reinforcement schedules. Right? Um, so a fixed ratio is just a it could be one to one, two to one, five to one, right? But it's the idea of continuous reinforcement, at least in the beginning. So every time you engage in this behavior, you'll you'll get the reinforcement. Hmm. So this is really helpful at first for training dogs, right? So right. if you're trying to teach the dog to pee outside, right, he's gotten outside, every time they go outside to pee, give them a treat, right? That's, yeah. that's the best way to teach them at first. Um, eventually, you know, you would increase it from one, uh, not a one-to-one -one ratio, but maybe a two-to-one to a four-to-one, four right? But ultimately what you want, and this actually leads to the best learning over the short term and long term, is variable ratio. And variable ratio, and I mentioned this before with casinos, um, is, is let's say you have a variable ratio of three to one. What that means is on average, the, the dog or the person will be reinforced uh, every three times they engage in that behavior. But it's an average. So they might be reinforced the first time they engage in that behavior or again, five times later, maybe eight times later, right? Maybe another time uh, they re reinforce twice after they engage in the behavior. Right. And so it, it, the variable ratio of three to one is really just going ahead and saying that it's an average, but that not knowing that intermittent reinforcement is the strongest type of reinforcement, again, over the short term and the long term. Um, fixed but, interval but, or, but, but yeah. just let me stop you there. I'm, I'm sure. again thinking of all these things in, in the context of our current situation. Mm -hmm. um, so say I said to myself, I'm going to give myself a gummy bear every 
sentence that I write. That's a fixed ratio, right? Uh, is this how it would work? Um, yeah. But but the only way I can get a real variable interval is if I have a machine or something dispensing the gummy bears per sentence. Yes, right, right. And so when Skinner was going and doing these studies, he would put them, put the animals in particular in a Skinner box, pigeons and uh, rats, right, in particular. Um, and so he was in control of that. I would put them, whenever they would press the lever, he would go ahead and dispense um, a treat on whatever schedule he created. But yeah, someone else or a machine would need to do that for you. Got it. And and you're saying, so we still have these kind of things and, and see them in everyday life, like casinos and online mm -hmm. media and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it actually occurs quite often. Um, I mean, the thing I love about behaviorism is that this is directly applicable to all of our lives at every second of the day. You know, and so I, I think that any behavior you've done it really has been reinforced in some capacity for it to continue. But right? even knowing that, I'm sure you still find struggles to like, how does, how do you, how does knowing that change the way you live your life? Yeah, so it's a good question. So I think then you can be more deliberate with what you're doing. Hmm. Um, and so if you think about, just go back to like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement for a moment. But if we do so much, uh, if so much of what we do is based off negative reinforcement. So addiction, for example, um, a lot of people who suffer from addiction, right, is based on negative reinforcement. They don't want to feel certain emotions. And so as a result, they go ahead and use, right? Mm. And we can understand finding an emotion so overwhelming. Even if we're not using, we can understand that concept of finding an emotion so overwhelming that we want to not feel that emotion. We all participate in that in some capacity, even if we're not talking about using, Right? Maybe we're talking about playing the Switch or playing Xbox, right? I'm mm -hmm. feeling so stressed right now. Let me go ahead and play a few games of Smash, right? <laughs> or Fire Emblem. <laughs> yeah. um, but but we, we all participate in that in some capacity, right? And so that's negative reinforcement. So you're trying to take away an aversive stimulus. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but knowing that this reinforcement continues a behavior, I want to go ahead and incorporate more positive things in my life, more reinforcement things, uh, more reinforcement, positive reinforcement based paradigms in my life. So I love magnolia trees and cherry blossoms. I think they're gorgeous. I've been down to the DC yeah. during the cherry blossom festival. It's stunning. I was there actually two years ago for it and it's just stunning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so because that's so important to me during this quarantine, at least for me, quarantine up here for New York, um, I made a point to kind of go at least for on a a walk um, past magnolia trees and cherry blossoms just to find them to be so enjoyable. Hmm. Um, and so that is, by knowing all this stuff, I can go ahead and change my life based off that. Or, right, I can also go ahead and change a certain behavior based off this too, right? So, this is a good example. Um, if I know, for example, I really want to go, go to the gym, right? That's like a common example. Um, you can go ahead and set yourself up on a reinforcement-based paradigm to help you go to the gym, right? And start titrating it up more, the more and more. Um, so I'm not going to go ahead and go to the gym for two hours at a time if I'm just starting again, right? right. I'm going to go ahead and maybe go for 15 minutes just to get myself back into the swing of things. And then once I go to the gym, I'm going to reinforce myself, right? I can't reinforce myself with ice cream because that doesn't work, right? But yeah. I reinforce myself with something else that I really like, right? Maybe playing the switch, right? Maybe reading a good book about physics that I wanted to get back into, right? Whatever it might be, you know, I can reinforce myself in that way. It, it seems so many of our positive reinforcements, though, especially as humans, and maybe this is why we're struggling so much, it comes from other people. Like, I get so excited mm -hmm. when I go for a run, and then there's other people to run with me. But now we're being told that we can't do that. Um, yeah. Is it, yeah. So it, uh, are there are, substitutes for that? Or is that just a, that's the genes part of it? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, because we, we are social beings by nature. Um, and we've known that for quite some time. Um, I think there is, we can still use like some features such as Zoom, right? To try and speak to mm. people. Although well, it's not the same, obviously. Um, but what is interesting, and there's some conflicting research on the use of technology and um, social skills and emotions. And what they find though is if you're using um, technology 
as like people who play Xbox Live constantly, right? If that becomes your social network, right? If that becomes the way you communicate with other people, they've actually shown that they have that they report less loneliness than than somebody who's using um, Facebook or Twitter, kind of scrolling through quickly, right? Mm. If your social network network is purely online, not make you more susceptible to loneliness. Can you say that again? I think you're cutting out a little bit. Community. So even like, so for example, I've been Zooming a little bit with some of my friends. Uh, same, for you, same for you. I can't go ahead and see them right now. Mm -hmm. um, but going ahead and having this connection online can still actually lead to decreased loneliness, decreased anxiety, decreased depression. Uh, and it gives us something different to do, something to look forward to, which I think is just so important. Interesting. And and you've mentioned that you're teaching, you teach undergrads mm -hmm. and, and you're teaching through this method, are you not? Yeah, yeah. So um, I teach a lot of courses, uh, probably too many. <laughs> um, I teach six and a half courses right now. Oh, jeez. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I teach a lot. <laughs> um, but I, I love it. I love teaching. Um, and so a few of them I have based on discussion uh, posts and ass written assignments through Canvas. Um, but there are quite a few of them also meeting online in this way and through Zoom. Um, and and do, you, do you find it positive for the student? Like, because I know there's a, there's a lot of stress around this, certainly for academics who are teaching and for people who are not quite to the undergrad level about should students even be doing this? Yeah, so it, What's funny is um, I saw an article about using synchronous uh, technology, synchronous uh, class time, meaning should we really be having a Zoom session of class during what you normally have, right? So if my class is normally 145 to 305, should I make them come on for a Zoom session at that time? And I, I polled my class to see what they thought, what they wanted, at least a few of them. Nice. And what I found actually was that they wanted that. Most well, of them want to have a Zoom class, yeah, which that was really interesting, right? So it goes back to that idea of wanting that social interaction, wanting to be with people. And people, I think, want to learn, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they'd want to have that for every single one of their classes. I'll say that much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is interesting, at least the ones I polled, is that the majority of people really wanted to have a Zoom class. And the only people that I saw that said no was because they were concerned about other people not having good uh, internet connection. Hmm. Um, which is, yeah, which is interesting that they were that considerate. Um, but they themselves wanted to have it. And so yeah. um, I, I do find that this way is effective. Um, and we're still able to have good conversation, right? I don't think, at least for me, I, I don't believe good teaching should be completely didactic. I should think it should be conversational. Um, yeah. And so uh, we, we do have conversation. We do laugh, right? I, I do uh, fumble with technology a little bit as they make fun of me for it. <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you know, it, it really is uh, a lot of good. I, I think it's a lot, of, a lot better doing it that way than discussion points, discussion posts for some classes. Hmm. And so the, the plan in the immediate is to continue with this. Are, are there ways that you can make these online social interactions you've kind of mentioned one doing the same time and same place like having a place to be are there other ways to make it more of a real community yeah so there's i know there's some research looking at that in like the education field um one thing i do i, I teach another class completely online um and from the beginning it was always that way and um i have something called the water cooler dialogue and so in it, I, you know, it's a, it's a uh, optional discussion post, right? That I, I just kind of leave hanging up there, right? In the canvas pinned. Um, and I tell them, you know, look, I understand that, you know, in normal class, you would be able to have kind of banter back and forth and you know, to have conversation before class, after class. Sometimes when I'm speaking, they sometimes talk to one another, right? <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you don't have that as much in an online class. So I have a discussion post up there called the water cooler. If people want to go ahead and post there, just speak and communicate with one another um, about anything, right? They can do that. Um, I also, for the discussion post each class, I do require them to reply to at least two of their peers. So mm -hmm. they can certainly get a chance to know one another that way. Um, 
And the research really does show the, the more of a community you create, the better learning for everybody. And so I think it's a little bit challenging to do it online, but I do think it's possible. Um, I think I, I have a few people right now kind of working on a Google Doc together um, per class for a few different reasons. Um, and even that, right, increases communication, right? And so the more communication I can kind of instill in them, I think the better. Hmm. And now you've also talked, I'm afraid we're not going to get to all of the history, but, but as far as practice now throwing us into the, the present day and the future of psychology, how has the current moment changed? How? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I think I can kind of summarize at least the third part of behaviorism, because I think it relates to what we're talking about is this idea of social interaction, right? So the third wave is socio-behaviorism, just, 1960 to about the present right now uh, and so it's really this idea of modeling you learn from other people right and so you learn what to do and what not to do from other people um, and so Albert Bandura was a big researcher on this um, and I think that is so relevant to today right I mean um, I think talking about students you learn what to do what not to do how to how what's appropriate to do in a certain context from one another um, Certainly, I mean, I grew up one of five, but step and a half siblings, I'm one of nine. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of us, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was the second oldest of five. Um, and so my siblings found out, my younger siblings found out what not to do from me, right? And so they right. did not make the same mistakes. <laughs> um, because I would go ahead and make it, and they learned that I got in trouble for it. So not don't do that in the future. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, kind of, going forward how do we i guess continue to learn from one another i think it's so important to still maintain contact with one another especially given the current times Hmm. right so how do we go ahead and um still continue to have maybe zoom sessions or facetime if you have an iphone um i'm an android all the way kind of guy yeah Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, how do you go ahead and um you know just maybe play more video games online if you have that possibility right um, watch TV shows together, right? I know some people get creative with in that way. You can be video chatting with someone, right? And both of you can start a TV show at the same time. And this way, it's it's kind of like you're watching it together, but hmm. not quite. Um, and so I think that that continued social interaction is incredibly important. Um, and I think, you know, creating a to-do list for yourself, if that's one suggestion I can give everybody right now, it's, you know, in terms of trying to get through the day, is use these principles of behaviorism, right? Positively reinforce yourself to create a schedule and do things that you maybe A, wouldn't normally do right now, or just to help you get through the moment, right? Because if everyone's locked into their location, um, it's very easy to feel, um, uh, you know, to kind of go stir crazy, right? Given everything. And I think if you go ahead and the night before create a to-do list for the following day, that can really, really help. Creating that schedule is so important. Otherwise, right, just having that switch available to wake up and play every single morning, you can get lost in that, <laughs> and that's no longer reinforcing, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah no. So, I, yeah, I think ahead. I think it's good advice. Um, it, it that I'll I'll put that to the side, and, and I'm going to make you make an another suggestion because we're we're at that point anyway. And at the end of the show, we usually make a, a general suggestion to the audience. I think to do list is actually a great place to start. I'm not going to take that as your official one, but yeah. it's a great place for people to start. And um, sometimes sometimes I make mine very small, so I don't get too mm-hmm. too depressed at the end of the day when I didn't do any of the to do. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> But as far as other suggestions, uh, what, what do you have for people? Yeah. Um, so I would really, look, I think that the, this idea of behaviorism, the study of behavior is the best way to go ahead and change your behavior. It's make you do, help you do anything you've been dying to do, right? Mm-hmm. If you've been trying to get back to the gym, to try and read again, to try and uh, learn something new. Right, and so I would really go ahead and dive deeper into the study of behaviorism. Um, if anybody's interested, I wrote a chapter on behaviorism. I can um, post yeah. that, you know, um, for people. But I think learning more about Skinner's book, um, Skinner's work, rather, um, I think that would be incredibly helpful because you can take that and apply that throughout. Hmm. Um, you know, so 
Skinner wrote uh, a few different things, right? But in particular, the, the behavior of organisms and experimental analysis is really great. Or in 1953, his work, The Science of Human Behavior, um, that's really helpful in terms of trying to apply this information, right? And change your own behavior, right? Or, or continue the behavior you want to do. Um, but the biggest thing I would say on top of that is to use that to live the life that you want to live. Hmm. And so focusing more on that positive reinforcement as opposed to the negative reinforcement. Awesome. That, that's a great suggestion. And, and we'll have a link absolutely to the, to the uh, uh, chapter and to the books and all the sort of great things that were mentioned in this conversation. Um, I'm, I get to make a suggestion too. and <laughs> Mine's going to be far, far less refined. Um, but <laughs> no, but we've been talking about video games. I think this is a good time to play. And I think it's, it is a nice escape sometimes. And you want one that you can get very immersed in. Of course, Tom mm -hmm. mentioned Smash and, and Fire Emblem. And, and these are great. And those get my full recommendation but right now uh, football manager uh, 2020 by Sega is free for anyone to try downloadable on Steam until April 1st to help get through us it's it's a game that you can get totally immersed in it, some people have criticized it as a uh, basically spreadsheet simulator but it does let you play with fake finances players teams seasons and none of the seasons are canceled by covid so you can enjoy <laughs> enjoy that and and it it's great for learning geography flags as well it's in, interesting i've had a few students who have played football manager and they're mm -hmm. just wrote geographic knowledge of cities countries names yeah. languages it's just fantastic I'd be sure to write that down. That's a great recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and uh, thanks for joining us, Tom. Uh, I know everyone's going through their, their own battle in, you know, serious and, uh, and shocking as it is for some and, and boring as it is for others. You know, we're all struggling at, at different points and different stages of this thing. And it's great to have, uh, professors and, and experts who are busy still give their time to speak on these podcasts that people can enjoy all over the world for free. So is there anything else you wanted to add before we sign off here? No, I just want to say thank you. I mean, I really enjoy this. Um, I think that it's, I love listening to podcasts. Um, I think it's really helpful for me. And so I'm happy mm -hmm. to be able to kind of give back at least a little bit. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. On the Hour of History, it's our world anytime, any place. So long. <laughs>